You can become smarter than the average tither. Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Well, it is so good to be together with you once again as we continue our journey through the New Testament chronologically. And our study today brings us back to Acts chapter 4 as we're looking at the uh, at Christian life in the early church. I believe that uh, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to record the book of Acts so that every subsequent generation of the church could look back at the early church and judge our experience by their experience. And hopefully uh, you're doing that. I know I'm certainly doing that as we work our way through these first chapters of Acts. This primitive church is the church in all of its purity and all of its simplicity. When we've got God-anointed uh, ministers, apostles, we've got people really repenting, really being born again, people who are truly true disciples of Christ, hungry for the word of God, obedient to his commandments. And by this, we can, you know, have a gauge to judge our experience as followers of Jesus Christ. Okay, last time we were together, we were taking a look at Acts chapter 4 and verses 32 and 34 and 35. And I want to go back there because there's more that needs to be said. And this is very important because we're going to talk about something that's being neglected by so many quarters within the church today. All right, so read with me in Acts 4 and verse number 32. We're going to skip over 33 and then read 34 and 35. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. So they were sharing everything. And we skip over verse 33 just for now. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them, bring the proceeds of the sales, and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. Okay, now I mentioned to you last time uh, we need to define what need is, uh, and, and we defined it from a biblical perspective. Real needs are food and clothing and shelter, okay? And so when they were distributing the proceeds of what people were laying at their feet, the apostles, to those who were in need, they were meeting very, very pressing needs. This was not, you know, a redistribution of wealth so that everybody could come up to the same level, some coming down, some coming up, and so we'd all be at the same standard of living. This was people who had more than they needed liquidating their property, unselfishly giving and sharing, and the apostles distributing to those who were starving or in need of food to some degree and who needed clothing or shelter, okay? People who were really needy. And the result of what they did is that there was no needy person among them. Praise God. Wasn't that beautiful? That's an illustration of loving our neighbor as ourselves. Modern day Christians uh, seem to not be familiar with this, and I, I think I know some of the reasons why. Um, one of the reasons is because we're all so rich, and, and when we do give, we often just give to people who the Bible would declare as not being needy people at all. And let's face it, most of us aren't seeing people who are without food or clothing, and there are so many social services in Western cultures and countries and wealthy countries like the one I'm living in and probably the one you're living in, you know, that th these needs have really been uh, addressed by and large. And, and even the people in our country who are on welfare, that is, they're living completely by government support, are much, much, much more wealthy than average people living in developing countries, okay? So this is like a foreign thing to us. Um, does that mean we have no responsibility? Oh, no, 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 no. We're a family. We're part of the family of God. Our family members are all over the world. And so this is something that we ought to be uh, looking at is how does this have application to us? Some people will be quick to say, oh, that was just the early church, some unique characteristic of, of them, and God's not requiring that of us. And that's not true, because Jesus commanded all of his followers to do what these people were doing, these early saints, uh, to dispossess, self-dispossess. You have so much and get rid of it so that you can meet the needs of those who are really, really suffering. Uh, and you can understand why, in God's eyes, that would be the right thing to do. And to not do that would be the wrong thing to do. 
Uh, may I read to you from Luke chapter 12 and verse number 33? These are the words of Jesus to all of his followers at one time. Sell your possessions. See, that's dispossess and give to charity. Make yourselves per money belts or purses which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes nor near nor moth destroys. And so there you have it. Jesus told all of his followers to dispossess. He wasn't telling them like modern day prosperity preachers are telling their wealthy constituents, God wants to make you even richer than you already are. He was telling them, God has already blessed you and so you need to dispossess. And uh, this thing, same message was taught by the Lord Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6 and verse number 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Very similar to what we just read in Luke chapter 12. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. Okay, so there it is. Who would say that, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount is irrelevant to us today? Come on. You know, that's Christ's commandments to his disciples. Uh, and, and the same message is carried throughout uh, the New Testament. We'll maybe at some time in the near future look at a few other verses. Okay, so what I'm saying is we should all be asking ourselves the question, how have I obeyed Jesus Christ's commandment here regarding stewardship? Uh, am I lulled into thinking that as long as I tithe and tithe to the local church, uh, something else that's not contained in Scripture, uh, I'm okay in God's eyes? Or, or perhaps is there more that God requires of me? You know, again, it certainly is easy for a person who makes a million dollars a year to tithe on a million dollars. But it's easy for someone who makes $100,000 a year to tithe, you know, their income. Is that a sacrifice? You know, is, it, is God pleased if you're just living on the 90000 while many of his children are suffering the basic necessities that he declares are their needs? No. No, okay? And so we need to find ways to obey Christ in this regard. And what I said to you before, I'm going to repeat it, you know, one of our challenges is, is finding people who are this needy in our uh, prosperous bubbles that we all, so many of us, live in, okay? And that's what I want to talk to you about uh, in the next time, okay? Uh, how can we find these kinds of people and meet their needs? I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. Welcome back to Acts chapter 4. We're looking at a portion of Acts that I think is often overlooked, or if it is uh, read in a sermon or in a Bible study, it's quickly passed over and somehow the message is sent, it's not really relevant to us. However, this is an example of Christians obeying the commandments that Christ gave to all of his followers regarding stewardship and caring for the poor, specifically in caring for the truly poor, of which they're hard to find, as I've already said to you, in, in, in wealthy countries. Uh, even when we you know, see homeless people holding up signs and so forth, uh, looking for help, you know, we ask the question, why are you not seeking help at a homeless shelter? Uh, because there's so many of those around and so forth. And, and please don't, don't think that I'm being insensitive. It's just that I've traveled all over the world in the worst slums this, this, this world has to show anyone, where people are living in little cardboard shacks where sewage, raw sewage is running right by their front door. It's just an opening, and they're sleeping essentially on the ground, on cardboard, uh, at the mercy of the elements, and starving. Okay, and there are hundreds of thousands of people crammed into slums like that around the world. So what is called poverty in the wealthy Western world doesn't seem too much like poverty to those of us who have traveled outside. And the Bible definition, again, of, of you know, lack is lacking food and covering. All right, so I asked the question last time, how are we going to meet the needs of these kinds of people if we can't find them? Well, we need help. Uh, we, we need to employ uh, the help of some. Well, we could go ourselves. You can travel to Africa. You can travel to Asia. You can travel to Latin America. And you can find all kinds of brothers and sisters in Christ who really have some pressing needs. Um, and that's one way. You just go yourself. Or you can employ the help of an organization or a missionary or someone who does have direct contact with those types of people. I'm surprised there aren't 
more organizations that do that. If you know anything about Heaven's Family, you know that that's one of the major things that we do. And we've got specialized funds that uh, focus in on very pressing needs, for widows, orphans, the handicapped, um, those suff suffering uh, uh, as victims of natural disasters, those who have re are refugees who fl fled from wars and so on. And, and if you go to our website, heavensfamily.org, you can quickly learn all about that. We feel like we're providing a way for rich people like you and like myself to obey Christ's commandment in this regard, to care for the poor. But are we doing enough? That's another question. Is God satisfied if we're just tithing? I asked that question last time, and I think you know that I made it very clear. Where did Jesus talk about tithing? Jesus talked about don't lay up treasures on this earth, but lay them up in heaven. And so the obedient disciple, the wise follower of Christ, has his earthly pile as small as possible and his heavenly pile as big as possible. And in one, in one sense, Jesus is not asking us to give up anything. He's trying to save us from losing everything that we've worked so hard to gain. Right? Because he talked about how what we store up in, on the earth is only temporal because everything on the earth is only temporal. So that's why we should be laying up as much as we possibly can in heaven. And people who just tithe, and that's all they ever aspire to do, no matter how much they prosper, are missing that point. And that's why I'm talking about that point. You need to get with the Bible program and start laying up more treasure in heaven. You know, I guess tithing is laying up something there, but it seems to me that God's gauging us by our sacrifices, not by dollar amounts, right? Look at when, what Jesus said about that poor widow woman who put in just two little pennies, you know, and he said she's given more than all those wealthy people put together. They put, out, put in out of their abundance. She put in out of their need. All right, so let me caution you about giving uh, to the rich. Uh, that's often what our giving winds up being. We give to our churches. Well, there, you know, everybody in our churches, if you're in this country, in the United States of America, if you're in the UK, if you're in Australia, if you're in Western Europe, if you're in one of the major cities of Asia, you know, living in a high rise, you're wealthy by the world's standards. And, and to give to people who are like you, you know, Goodness, Jesus even warned about that very thing, didn't he? Can I read to you from Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse number 12? I, I've mentioned this in the past, but I, I feel like I better mention it again. Jesus also went on to say to the one who had invited him to a banquet at which he was seated, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return, and that will be your repayment. So, you, you know, you're, you're just giving and receiving back and forth. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So those parties and dinners you hold for your rich friends, and they will say, oh, you're so generous to you know, have, have this over and have steaks on the barbecue. Don't think that Jesus is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant for that barbecue you had for your rich friends. You know, those people don't need your help. They don't need your generosity. It's the, 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 the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and particularly those who are out of reach of all the social services that, that are so common in the wealthy countries. We've got to get beyond the borders of our own countries and reach out to people who are really, really, really needy. And if you know a missionary uh, or your church has contact with the missionary, there is a great way to get involved in meeting the pressing needs of the poor if that missionary is working where there are those kinds of poor Christians, okay? And many of them, of course, are doing that. This is something, I'm telling you, I'm just so burdened by this. This is something that is just so neglected within the within Christendom today, within most churches. It just seems like the stewardship and caring for the poor, true biblical stewardship and caring for the poor is just almost non-existent. Almost non-existent. Yet it's a regular common everyday feature in the book of Acts that Luke commented on on several occasions as he gave his narrative of early Christian life. This is a component of following Christ. If you are not doing something to care for the poor, you are missing God's will. You will have to give an account about it, okay, because it's so clearly in Scripture, okay? They laid their proceeds at the apostles' feet. How do we do that today? All right, well, so I'm gonna talk about next time 
I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. We are on Acts chapter 4. We're talking about biblical stewardship now. And uh, seeing that uh, it was a regular feature of New Testament life, giving to the poor, the biblical poor. I want to read to you from uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse number 17. Maybe we'll read 18 and 19 as well, where Paul gives Timothy some instruction as to what Timothy ought to be saying to those who were rich within his uh, sphere of influence and his flock. Instruct those who are rich in this present world. I love how Paul focuses on that. You know, just because you're rich in this present world doesn't mean you're going to be rich in the future world. If you're laying up all your treasure on the earth, you know, you're not going to be rich in the future world. If you're laying up your treasure in heaven, then you are going to be rich in the future world. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Next verse. Instruct them to, be, to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Okay, so that's the instruction. Make sure you instruct those who are rich to be givers, generous givers, rich in good works, always ready to share. Why? Verse 19, storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future. Just exactly what Jesus taught, right? Laying up treasure in heaven. Now listen, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. And I actually, you know, dug a little bit into the Greek here, and I think that the King James really does a better job at the end. It says that they may take hold of eternal life. So, you know, really Paul was tying this into eternal life. Well, that fits in to a lot of what scripture teaches. You know, can you be a greedy person and inherit eternal life? The answer is no. Can you not care about the poor if you have the means to help them and inherit eternal life? Absolutely not. Okay, if you want to take hold of eternal life, you're going to have to, you know, not lay up your treasures on this earth, but lay them up in heaven. Okay, now back to Acts, that passage of scripture that we're looking at, verse number 35. People are selling their homes, people are selling their lands, um, and we know that not everyone sold, you know, their house so that they had no place to live themselves, but people who own multiple houses perhaps, or people who had land that they had no need of, that they weren't using, they were selling that, laying the proceeds, this is now verse number 35, and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they would be distributed to each as any had need. I like that. Okay. Obviously, people trust the apostles, uh, you know, and, and, and trust them enough to take the money that they've gained by selling some major possession and, and laying it at their feet and saying, you go ahead and distribute it to those who have need. Um, so that tells me a couple of things. One of the things it tells me is that, uh, you know, there was a reason that people trusted the apostles and they could just lay the money at their feet like that. And no doubt one of the reasons they trusted them was because these men were not living in luxurious self-indulgence like so many uh, others are today in the church world as a whole. Uh, y y you know, uh, when you give to somebody who's proven that they have no love of money because of their lifestyle, because they themselves have sacrificed everything, they themselves have dispossessed, you can say, well, you know, I can trust them with my money because they've proven that they don't have a love of money. And, and again, you know, we need, to, we, we need to only give to those who have proven themselves to be trustworthy in this manner. If you're using an agent, to help the poor, you need to make sure they are trustworthy. And the first place to look is at their personal lifestyle, okay? You know, when I look at the financial uh, revelations and the records of some nonprofit corporations, it's just shocking to me when uh, one of the major Christian humanitarian organizations, which if I named it, you would know that the, the, the president is making in excess of a half a million dollars a year, and that's even before all the other perks that come with his job. 
half a million dollars a year. How can you hold up a, 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 a picture of a starving child and say, help me help this child, but I'm gonna keep a half a million dollars of what people send for myself because that's what I'm worth. Doesn't that seem a little bit contradictory? Wouldn't you expect that someone who really wants to help the poor would be demonstrating it by their own lifestyle? And you say, well, maybe that person gives half of what they make you know, to their own organization. Well, uh, if they did, they would just tell the trustees, uh, cut my salary in half and use that other half to, to give to the poor. Because if he, if he doesn't do that, then he's going to be paid by the organization, he's going to pay taxes on that, and then he's going to have less that he can give back to the poor. So he would just have his salary cut. But take a look at the houses where they live. Houses, plural. Take a look at their vacation homes and so forth and, and what they're driving. And, and you know, these are dead giveaways that why would anyone entrust money that's earmarked for the poor to people who are so incredibly wealthy, who are in the upper, you know, one half percent of even the wealthy people in the United States? It doesn't make any sense to me at all, okay? That's why I love, uh, you know, entrusting people who, who are missionaries, for example, who have already made huge sacrifices, who have proven that, that they don't have any love for money whatsoever. They've put all that aside and they've gone to a foreign field to reach out to, you know, those who have not heard the name of Christ or uh, those who are very poor. And those people are great people to connect with. And I'm so thankful. It, the organization which I'm blessed to direct, Heaven's Family, we've got lots of friends like that around the world, and that's the folks that we use to help the poor. And uh, praise God, we, but we, we, we check them out. Make sure that you know their lifestyle doesn't betray that a love of money or a reason not to trust them. Why? Because, you know, we don't know what you're doing with the money we give you. It looks like, you know, you might be spending it on yourself with all the expensive stuff that you seem to be acquiring. Where do you get your money? Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, out of time. We'll look at a very interesting story next time about a guy who falls dead in church, then his wife falls dead. All right. Don't miss it. See you next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind the scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.